Hello and welcome to the Laura Tutorials. My name is Alan and in today's session we're going to jump into the user interface of the Laura network server and specifically focus on the networks menu. Within there we'll have a look at the different menu items, features and the value these features provide when building our LoRaWAN network. So if you'd like to learn more about that, stick around and let's jump in. Okay guys, so let's log into our user account of the network server. And obviously we're going to land straight onto the dashboard. Um, and today we're going to focus on the networks tab. And as we previously discussed in the other tutorial, a network is a logical grouping of your gateways. So that might be based on location or type of gateway or use case. Um, and so on and you may spread your gateways across multiple networks or you may put all your gateways within one single production network let's say the important thing to remember is that just because you separate gateways into different networks it doesn't mean that they won't roam for all your devices on the network so it's really just um, an organizational structural thing let's say so we're going to um, first jump into my network and here we'll see an overview of all the gateways we have in our network and we can basically look for specific gateways by their name by their mac address so if you know you've got a list of a couple of hundred gateways here you can quickly find the gateway you need by searching by its mac address or a custom name that you've set for it uh, and we have some information about the network for example when we created it if other users within my organization can see this network and they can also maybe edit or just read only the network um, some other user information to do with roaming that we'll go into another time and then let's say uh, yeah home where we've set this network based and typically that'll be like a city or a location or something like that um, we've got some menu items here if we want to edit the name uh, remove that visibility for other users in the organization we can um, and also edit the location the important thing is remove network um, if you do this it'll actually let's say remove the whole network including all the gateways in there so be careful with that if you want to remove a individual gateway using this menu item you can just select it and then um, press the, the remove gateway button finally to add a new gateway we have the option to do it here um, we can allow the network server to know our location if we want to populate the location for the gateway we put it and then we add the gateway as we did in the previous tutorial but today's session we're going to have a look at the menu items once we've added our gateway it's connected to the server and we can say it's started to send some initial data so we have an um, initial landing page for the gateway where we have pretty much an overview of all the key metrics we want with this particular gateway uh, importantly things like latency so what's the round trip time for a ping pong to the gateway from the network server um, last connect is when it last re-established that web socket between the network server and the gateway and that's a, a permanent connection so that we can let's say monitor the status and health of the gateway and sometimes maybe you have some high latency on a cellular network it may disconnect for 10 seconds a couple of seconds and then reconnect again uh, things like last keep alive last data these are you know when the last packet came uh, when we last did that ping pong mechanism and so on this is really just a tab to make sure that your gateway is connecting with good latency um, and it's you know recently that, that those things have happened we have a bit of a pie chart here for an uptime and downtime overview um, my gateway is plugged in and out so this is related not to the server's uptime and downtime, but specifically to this gateway. So for example, if I've had it plugged in or if I've had it connected to the internet or not. Then we go down and we see some more information regarding the actual, let's say, specs of the gateway itself. So it's MAC address, what model it is. Um, we have the SSH tunnel proxy command there if we need to do that. Um, lots of information regarding the concentrator, kernel, all that kind of stuff. Um, the EFO address, etc etc and then down here a few interesting menu items we've got um, community access essentially if this is enabled and my gateway here's another packet from a device that also belongs to this network ie on this server but to another user on this server if I enable this that packet will still be routed to that user's end destination whatever that is now if I disable it 
The network server will still receive these packets from all LoRaWAN devices, but if it doesn't belong to a device that I've provisioned within my account, it won't get routed to the end application. So in general, I think we want to default enable this because um, yeah, if it's already coming to the server, we might as well pass it on for other users on the network. And if you're on a private network server, then of course all gateways will want to root for all users. And if you're on a public network, then you're helping any other user, ensuring that their data gets to the end packet and they will do vice versa for you. Ignore data will essentially just um, stop the server routing all data. So data will still arrive to the network server from the gateway, but the the network server will be instructed not to process it any further, as it were, and route it to the end application specified by the user. Finally, we can go into the regions and we can change the regional plan. So all um, channel plans are available on all public servers, regardless of where they're deployed or hosted. So you can choose, um, obviously for this region I'm based in, it's uh, the EU863 x um, And if we want to, we can do some change the TX gain and add additional bands or remove them. So if we have a 16 channel, um, a dual antenna 16 channel gateway, you might want to set two times eight channel or one 16 channel spec. Okay, so that's the dashboard. We have some additional items here. One is to ping the gateway. This will essentially ensure that the gateway um, is responding to any pings from the network server. Uh, quick, let's say health check. We can move this gateway to another network if we wanted to. Um, so for example, I can move this over to the sample network. That's simply an organizational structure. And then we have an interesting one here, which is called tap into the data stream. So this is a, let's say, view or browser view of what a packet looks like when it's transmitted over the air. So the data will still be encoded, but we'll see essentially what any other gateway could see uh, regarding the say let's say public information of that packet being transported over the air uh, and it will list here all the different packets coming into your gateway some might belong to your network some might be your devices or other devices on the network server some may be other LoRaWAN devices in the area which belong to a, a, a different network so your gateway will essentially see all LoRaWAN packets that it can within its range as it were Okay, so let's jump over to the next menu items. We have device activity. Now this is um, more of a, say, let's say, historical view of the devices that have communicated via your gateway. Um, so we can see in the last hour that my sensor in my home has sent two data ups, and that's pretty much it. So it sends one every half an hour, I assume. But if we look at the last day, we can say, yeah, that's correlates, 25, that's about one every hour then. Um, and some data down, probably some Mac commands or something like that to the device. And over the last month, we can see the total values for this specific device. This is useful that when we're joining devices to the network, new devices, we can see, you know, for example, I've had 10 join requests and I've had uh, 10 join accepts sent down to the device and then data starts flowing up to the server. And you can see any devices that have maybe had lots of join requests, but no join accept values. And you may have to have a look at those devices and see why they're not joining the network. OK, so let's jump on to location. Essentially here we've got um, a Google Maps view of all the gateways that we've deployed within this network. Um, yeah, pretty useful to position for our city or for our region where you've deployed your specific gateways. And then you can you know, publish this map or use it to show um, other companies your coverage. In the traffics menu, this essentially is looking at the uplink frame count over the last 24 hours or the last day, something like that, or the last month. So we can see on a roughly on a daily basis since I plug my gateway back in that we're getting about 24 packets per day. So one an hour sounds good. Probably all we need for, I believe this is a condition monitoring device. So yeah, room temperature, humidity, all that kind of stuff. Once per hour is perfectly good. And importantly, if that's what I'm expecting, then I know that I'm not losing packets or receiving less data than I should be, or that the device is not overly transmitting and using up too much power. We jump into the radio. So this particular menu, I mean, a lot of what the network server does is about monitoring the performance of the network as far as the radio parameters, how devices communicating, what's the health of those devices, what's the quality that they're communicating to the server, and all that will relate to message delivery rate, 
uh, power consumption uh, and capacity across your whole network. But in order to view those values and ensure that um, the network is performing an optimal level, we need to understand and visualize in a human readable format how the radio behavior is happening across this specific gateway in this instance. So for example, we can see um, all the spreading factors that this gateway is receiving from devices that belong to the network. And ideally, we want to have our devices on spreading factor seven where we can. If a device is obviously not within optimal range, it may have to operate on spreading factor eight or nine and so on. But the difference between spreading factor 12 and seven regarding power consumption uh, is you know, many magnitudes and also having lots of devices on spreading factor seven is going to reduce the capacity of our network. So we want to have lots of devices essentially on the lowest spreading factor as possible. What we see here actually is quite interesting. Our devices started on spreading factor 12 when we first connected our device, which is what we expect because we want our device to broadcast with as much output strength as possible and send the message as slow as possible to ensure that our gateway has the best chance of receiving the packet. Once the network server's received uh, 11 successful uplinks, so you can see, the network essentially has told the device via the gateway that we've received your packets loud and clear. You can actually reduce the power output for your transmission and increase your data rate and increase the speed at which you send the signal. And then we jump down to uh, spreading factor 11. So it's a step-by-step -step process. Again, another 12, 13 packets. Once they successfully received with good radio parameters, it will jump down to 10, and then it will hop down to 9, um, 8, uh, 7, and then finally, yeah, down to 7. And now we're on spreading factor 7, which is exactly what we want. So that's good to see. That looks healthy. Um, if my devices were still on spreading factor 12 or 11, I might want to put a gateway closer to them or improve the quality of the gateway positioning in regards to the devices and so on. Now, when you've got many hundreds of devices in here, you can see an aggregated view how many are still on spreading factor 12, how many are on spreading factor 7, and you may want to do something about that with regards to gateway placement. We can also see what frequencies uh, the devices are transmitting on. This looks healthy because devices should be hopping pretty much with every uplink, what frequency they transmit on, and that we have a nice spread so that if we have many thousands of devices here, they're utilizing as many frequencies as possible um, to maximize the capacity of the network. Okay, so jumping quickly on to spectral scan. So this is um, in order to essentially have a look at how noisy the um, spectrum is with regards to radio waves in the area. Um, and if there's a specific, um, let's say, conflicting uh, frequency in the area from another proprietary system or something like that, then we may want to avoid using that specific frequency and instruct the device to not utilize that. Um, the system, this is more to do with the actual gateway itself. So if we take the daily view, for example, we can clearly see that my gateway was plugged in um, on yeah, four, 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 four and a half days ago. It had 10 hours uptime there, so about halfway through the day. And then since then, it's pretty much been online every day for 24 hours, which is exactly what we want to see, right? So ensuring um, that we've got consistent uptime. And if I did have any downtime or issues, then I could come back in here, maybe retrospectively, and see that my gateway disconnected or had connected issues on the 8th, um, and since then it's been offline, or then it re-established and it was a bit flaky around that particular day. Maybe that's why I lost some data, because this gateway went down, so I need to investigate. Um, similar with latency, now obviously latency is very important for a gateway, especially when devices are joining the network, so that the network um, can send down a join request to a device before it goes back to sleep. Um, over you know a month, let's say, you can see actually when I've had my gateway online, pretty good consistent latency because it's plugged in via my home network on Ethernet. Um, and then yeah, disconnect to my gateway in October, November, and just brought it back online in December. Um, so keep an eye on this, you want to see that obviously you've got a nice low latency. If you've got a very high fluctuation, it's typically because you're running on 3 or 4G, um, and the more stable the better. 
But this will also obviously drop down to zero when your gateway goes offline, so it may give you some indication of uh, when a gateway went offline. And then we have some historical uh, data with regard to free memory, so too bad here, looking okay, 43% utilization. Um, yeah, same here, not this with regard to Linux, not so bad at all, so nothing to worry about here. If your gateway is GPS enabled, unfortunately this one isn't, essentially what we'll say here is um, the GPS coordinates and how many satellites are within range of your gateway. Uh, this is particularly useful for multicast uh, functionalities or uh, geolocation functionality and so on. Then finally, the software menu, we've been here before in the provisioning gateway steps. This is essentially where you can um, find the LORIT packet forwarder and run the commands and download it to your uh, gateway in order for it to connect to the network server. The last menu or last two menus here is the logs. Uh, luckily I don't have any logs which is a good sign typically. The logs that are displayed here are typically to do with um, yeah, event logs that are um, errors or critical or warnings or information like your gateway is slightly has lost connection of the WebSocket and now it's reconnected again and it will show you a timestamp for how long that took um, and for example maybe when you've got some um, packet loss or something like that it will also show here and finally we have the alerts menu and this is probably one of the highest value menus within the networks tab um, if we enable this then I've essentially got six types of alert that I can uh, be notified on for my gateway Latency, if the latency goes over 800 milliseconds, because this is generally the threshold for when you may start to get um, join request, join accept issues for a device. But anything over 600, I would start to be concerned. Uh, and anything over 800 will probably be out of too much out of range. So you want to keep that as low as possible. And yeah, maybe your SIM operator starts to have issues and you see that you get a latency alert. Configuration change. Um, this is essentially to make sure that no one's configuring or changing the configuration of the gateway without your knowledge. You may have other users within your organization you're given access to. And if they do set a different channel plan or something like that, you want to be notified of when that's happened. Same with uh, memory utilization. We can here set, for example, a threshold that if we get over 50%, 70% that we get notified because it may signal a problem with the gateway. Exactly the same for the CPU utilization. Um, so you want to set these at a value that are not too low, that you start getting constant um, emails or notifications via WebSockets or SNMP traps that, you know, nothing to really act upon because you set it too low. So make sure it's a, a, a useful value. Uh, and then finally, we can, if we want to, set a um, daily uplinks notification. So if you know, for example, across your gateways, your average is, you know, 200 or 1,000 messages per day, whatever it is, and all of a sudden it's five times that, then it may be a signal for newer devices in the area that are putting a lot of traffic on there, or that your device is malfunctioning somehow, sending too many join accepts because it's lost, um, you know, mutual authentication with the network, something like that, then you can put a threshold on there. Um, so it kind of gives you an indication. It, same as obviously if it drops below. So this is a, go, a way to monitor, for example, if a device is no longer connected. Um, your average is 24 a day, now all of a sudden you're only getting 12, then you probably have some sort of problem to investigate. And finally, uh, a status change is quite simply if the gateway is disconnected or not, or goes online or offline, which um, yeah, I'd say is a, a mandatory one to have enabled on your gateway. The Any alerts that will be displayed will uh, be available in the alert history so when you come can come in here you can also check if there's been any alerts previously that you maybe um, didn't notice or something like that uh, and tie the dates in to any events that may be happened across your network. Okay so that's uh, a quick run through of the different uh, menu items and features within the networks tab. Uh, I hope that maybe gave you a, a good introduction and you can explore further here yourselves. Um, so that's it for now. If you'd like to learn any more, stick around for the next tutorial uh, and we'll jump into the applications tab and do the same. So thank you and take care. Bye bye.